we started um, investigating silicon solar cells back in the in the 50s um, and in the 70s came the first commercial systems uh, so some of them are actually still uh, out there in the field today so uh, when it comes to reliability and um, how silicon cells and panels withstand uh, the uh, the time and uh, and the effect of the external environment we actually have a, a pretty good idea because we have empirical da data from the late 70s. Um, back then, the price was uh, at least a factor of 100 higher than uh, it is today. Uh, so the price has declined uh, significantly since the late 70s and the efficiency has gone up and, and those things are uh, related. Um, but uh, that's basically the, the story that uh, we started in the, in the 70s with the very expensive systems that showed the potential and then economies of scale and maturing the technology increasing the efficiency uh, has really led to a reduction a rapid reduction in, in the price per kilowatt hour uh, and an increase in efficiency the silicon is uh, the most abundant uh, semiconductor material we have uh, available here uh, on earth it's uh, the second most abundant material uh, in the earth's cr crust after uh, oxygen so silicon is very abundant, um, and the band gap of silicon as a semiconductor is is um, is quite appropriate for for uh, photovoltaics for solar cells. At the moment, uh, silicon is the dominant material um, in the solar market. Uh, it's about ninety percent of the market share that's either mono or multicrystalline silicon, and it's actually been that way um, with a few uh, a few changes in the exact percentage, but Overall, silicon has dominated the solar industry uh, from, from the beginning. Uh, the, the primary reason being that silicon is an abundant uh, semiconductor material, that we're able to mass produce wafers and cells from this material um, at a low cost, at high quality. When you produce a, a typical silicon solar cell, um, you start with a silicon wafer that's approximately 180 micrometers thick, and you texture it. So the standard texturing is this wet chemical texturing. So if we talk about a monocrystalline cell, it's a, typically a potassium hydroxide, or at least a, um, an alkaline bath that etches these pyramids on both sides of the wafer. So you get these microscale pyramids. Then we need to form a PN junction. Uh, so that's basically the feature of a silicon cell that makes it uh, a diode and that makes it work uh, as a solar cell because we need a p-n junction to you could say direct the current so when we create an electron hole pair somewhere in the material the electron will flow in one direction and the hole in the other direction and we can collect these moving charge carriers on both sides of the cell or in some cases on different areas on the same side of the cell um, as a flowing current that we can extract and collect um, so the p-n junction is a very important part of the cell and typically we produce it by uh, if we have a p-type cell and we want to make an n-type region uh, closed uh, typically on the front surface we make a phosphorus diffusion so that means we take a batch of wafers into a tube furnace with a phosphorus containing gas and at around 900 degrees um, the phosphorus is um, diffused into the top micrometer or so of the of the silicon. Um, then we apply the anti-reflective coating, the PCVD uh, silicon nitride, hydrogenated silicon nitride, 75 nanometers typically on the front surface. That makes the cell look blue. And then we can screen print uh, the front and rear contacts. That's typically silver paste uh, on the front that's optimized to, to etch through uh, the anti-reflective coating and create a, a nice ohmic contact to the underlying highly damped silicon. And typically aluminum, an aluminum paste on the rear that makes a good contact to silicon, but also dopes the rear side of the silicon p-type. Aluminum is a p-type doping to silicon. And that means that we actually remove the phosphorus doped backside layer in the same process and create a, a p-plus layer that's called the back surface field. And we have the, the metal contact uh, as an aluminum contact on the rear and then a silver contact uh, grid on the front where the grid 
lines are optimized in terms of their width and their spacing so that we have just enough metal coverage to collect the current without big losses and just wide enough and, and deep in uh, and sufficiently deep context to collect the current without big ohmic losses. And that also means we typically have one or typically two or more bus bars across the section cell that are much wider uh, metal uh, wires that collect the current from all the small metal fingers. Um, both of these aluminum and, and silver contacts on front and rear are then fired at high temperature. That's where the paste diffuses through and into the silicon in some cases and then um, creates a good contact. Um, so to wrap it up, texturing, um, PN junction or emitter formation, anti-reflective coating, um, front and rear screen printing, co-firing, and then in the end we etch isolate the cell so that um, there's no way the current could run from front to back without going through the junction. Um, these cells may then be built and be um, contacted with uh, uh, ribbons to make uh, strings of multiple cells that are then connected to a panel uh, that's typically laminated with uh, EVA to protect these cells and then with a protective glass and then aluminum frame you get the final panel that can be installed in the field or on the roof. There's a lot of uh, debate going on how do we go beyond the Shockley Quizzer limit for silicon cells? How do we get to 40% uh, efficiency? And that's of course keeping in mind that at some point uh, we, have, we start to have reduced uh, all the cost components that we can. Uh, we have to get even more kilowatt hours out of each square meter. Um, also because the installation costs per square meter uh, are uh, probably harder to reduce at a rapid pace than the actual production of the cells. So each square meter becomes important. How, how much can we get out of that? And in order to do that, and keeping silicon as a base material, which I think makes a lot of sense because of its abundance and our production capabilities for that material, I think we need to make tandem cells uh, with um, one or more, but, but I think one other material, one other uh, cell on top of silicon, a thin cell, uh, will be a, a really hot and really uh, promising alternative to the standard silicon cell. So putting, for example, a thin perovskite uh, solar cell on top of a silicon solar cell um, and optimizing that tandem uh, stack, uh, I think that's a very promising uh, solution. Um, obviously there are some challenges with perovskite cells but looking at the rapid development, the positive development with that technology and combining that with the high efficiency silicon cells that we know we can mass produce now, um, I think that combination is very promising and I think that means that if we just ask the question, what will be the base material of the majority of cells on the solar market in the future, my answer will be silicon.